to share your screen? Yeah, you yes. want me to go ahead and screen share? Uh, no, no uh, she was asking like my oh, okay. thing. Okay. Uh, okay, go ahead. You want me to go ahead and screen share now? No, I'm gonna screen share and then she's gonna oh. she's gonna run it through and then. Sounds good. Sorry about that. A little bit of technical difficulties, but um, here we go. So, hello everybody. Welcome to today's session. My name is Madeline Babb, and I'm the executive vice president of Pre-Med CC, a student-led organization established in the fall of 2021. Our goal as an organization was to create an online program for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hopes of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. We know how challenging finding guidance and mentorship can be, especially in the middle of a pandemic. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, our events are open to anyone. We realize that finding guidance and mentorship in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation pre-med students, people that lack the financial resources, or just those that do not know anyone in the medical field. One of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can do it from the comfort of your own home or wherever you may be. We typically have events on most Fridays from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, and on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Pacific time. If you aren't able to attend the event, all of our sessions are uploaded on our YouTube channel. Many of our sessions will end with a Q&A with our speakers. Any questions that you have can be put in the Q&A section on Zoom and our team members will read them and have them answered for you. After, you. after you have attended our event, you can log into our website and complete the quiz, which will contain questions pertaining to today's session. If you score 70% or higher on the quiz, you will be awarded a certificate to show that you have attended our session today. Students that attend all of our sessions this school year will receive a pre-med CC Scholar Award for all of the hours and mentorship they have completed. If you wanna stay connected with our upcoming events or wanna tell your pre-med friends that are struggling to get mentorship hours about pre-med CC, our social media accounts are all at pre-med CC. And there's some past events. So today I'm gonna to introduce our speaker. Today we are honored to host three members of the Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Joining us is Dr. Joel Maurer, the Assistant Dean for Admissions and Associate Professor of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Biology. Dr. Maurer received his bachelor's degree at Grinnell College and his medical degree from the University of Nebraska Medical Center. He completed two residencies, the first in family medicine and the second in obstetrics and gynecology. Dr. Maurer has over 17 years of experience in clinical medical education. Thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Maurer. You're very welcome and thank you for having me today. Um, would now be a good time for me to try to screen share? Okay, let me see if I can do that. <laughs> All right, let's see, what do you guys see? We're good, okay. All right, well, welcome everyone. And again, thank you for um, joining us today. Um, you know, hopefully I can kind of get through this presentation in the next half hour to 45 minutes so that there's plenty of time for uh, questions and answer period. Um, uh, Cause I imagine there may be a few um, and, um, and with that, we'll get started. So um, let's see, there we go. So I have a few goals uh, today. Um, I want to share with you. Uh, first, I want to sort of give you some background information on how to uh, think about applying to medical school and things that you need to sort of be always thinking about. Um, give you a little bit of some insiders tips about how to think about where to apply to medical school. Um, I, I, I don't uh, initially had a slide in here on getting feedback, but we can certainly talk about that if we have time. And then I definitely do want to have time to just um, give you a little bit of some background information on the College of Human Medicine here at Michigan State. So, oh, did I go? There we go. All right, here we go. Sorry, I'm Got a happy clicker here today. So, you know, the first part is everyone probably realizes in the steps to applying to medical school, it has to, um, the, the, there's a couple important pieces. You know, obviously that written application uh, to medical school is, is really an important piece. And then hopefully for many, if not most of you, there's an interview piece. 
uh, that is a part of the application process. That written application though, that first piece um, asks a whole lot of questions um, and gives you lots of opportunities to share your life experiences. It will give you opportunities to sort of share and disclose the various ways in which you identify as an individual. Um, clearly they want to have some opportunity to have an assessment of your academic performance uh, while preparing for a uh, future career in medicine. We wanna know about your activities, the personal character that comes um, from you as you describe those life experiences in your personal statement, secondary essays, how others who you have uh, worked with and, got, and, and have taught you with, uh, within their uh, respective letters of support. Um, and um, the, there's even some opportunities now for medical students or pre-med students to um, sort of uh, give medical schools an idea of their readiness from a personal character perspective uh, to going to medical school. Many schools are instituting something called situational judgment testing, and I'll touch on that a little bit later in the talk. Um, and then, you know, uh, after you've applied to medical school, hopefully there will be uh, a handful of schools that will want to uh, interview you. And those interviews can be anywhere from a one-on-one -on -one sort of traditional interview. There's a new interview instrument or framework called a multiple mini interview in which you have a series of short sort of eight to 10 minute or six to 10 minute interviews um, with a different person uh, every you know 10 to 15 minutes. And then some places do institute a group interview where it's you, maybe it's just you with uh, a number of other um, administrators and faculty and students at that respective medical school versus the other way around. Maybe it's one of those individuals and um, it's in a group interview with you and a series of other fellow applicants. So, um, so there's lots of different ways in which medical school admissions offices and areas have approached the interview process. One thing I do really wanna spend some time talking about uh, with regards to the introduction of all of this is is this concept of holistic review of the medical school application. Um, I'm gonna say, you know, back in the 1980s, when, when I was a pre-med student, um, I would say the application process wasn't near as elaborate as it is today. Um, I think um, more and more medical schools are thinking very hard about what their goals and needs need to be for the future of healthcare in this country and beyond. And so um, more and more medical schools are adopting this idea of um, full, a, a, a very thorough and full review of all areas of an application as opposed to just focusing on academic performance. I think that was sort of the the issue when I was applying in the 1980s, um, I think most admissions areas mainly concerned about the academic piece of it and less so about the other two areas that are now, I think uh, every bit is important. Um, and, and those of us that are applying holistic review are doing it in a way because we wanna see meaningful change uh, in how healthcare is thought about in this country. We know that we have to have an in increasingly diverse uh, student body in order to meet the very diverse needs of uh, healthcare needs of our country. And usually this uh, admissions holistic review process involves a balance between these three areas based on the respective missions of our medical school um, that, that focus on academic performance and metrics, those activities that you've been involved with that are consistent with uh, a future career in medicine, and then those sort of very personal attributes and characteristics that you bring to the table that make, uh, really make you a wonderful future physician uh, because you're going into it hopefully for the right reasons. 
Um, I do want to spend just a little bit of time uh, sharing with you some recent data that does support how medical schools are trying to do a increasing, um, increasing their efforts and focus on diversity of their incoming student bodies. Um, this was, oh, I don't know when this study was done, but fa fairly recently, um, within the last couple years, uh, it was a, a survey that was sent to uh, admissions, uh, medical school admissions deans across the country, asking them how important is it for your school to select students for your 2021 entering class who are likely to contribute to the following educational mission areas. And so, um, and among the many factors of your holistic review, how important it is, is uh, how important to your educational mission is considering applicants with the following backgrounds and lived uh, experiences. And 98% of those uh, who responded uh, uh, consider uh, uh, contributing to a diverse physician workforce and a very important aspect of their mission. So medical school admissions areas are definitely looking at the various ways in which um, applicants self-identify uh, on a, a medical school application, creating thoughtful opportunities for applicants who may not have the same types of advantages as many of the other applicants in the applicant pool for a variety of reasons. Um, we're specifically looking at applicants who come from medically underserved areas that we believe are gonna contribute to healthcare in those medically underserved areas. We know that applicants that come from urban and rural areas um, are more likely to return to those same uh, high need areas once they graduate from medical school and get their, uh, uh, and get their residency training done. So these are all really important things that we are looking at. Um, and, you know, along with that, we understand that, um, that getting an education uh, from, for uh, people who come from or identify from disadvantaged backgrounds um, is a challenge. And there's lots of things that go into that and how your trajectory gets to the point from point A to point B, hopefully ultimately point B is that four-year college degree. Um, but we look at th that pathway in the context of the life experience that you've had and how is that going to provide you with the background to really help relate to patients um, that also maybe have similar um, life challenges and obstacles to overcome. So it's an important piece that, that more and more medical schools are, are starting to take uh, very thoughtful notice of. Um, this is continuation of that same uh, survey. Uh, and uh, this is a data base that is showing uh, rep, uh, and represents responses of whether or not admissions areas currently use or, or are hoping to consider using as uh, soon as possible um, and in responding to which of the following data about an applicant's educational opportunities, lived experiences, and background characteristics does your school currently consider when interpreting academic me metric data? So your MCAT scores, and your undergraduate GPAs. And so, so, you know, medical school admissions areas are starting to think more and more about um, the college experience that, that all of you are having or have had, um, uh, whether or not you uh, attended uh, under-resourced uh, uh, high school or college, um, again, your community that you grew up in um, that, that made life more challenging for many people. We're, we're starting to look more and more at that. This is kind of where medical school admissions areas are currently as a whole. As you can see, there's a lot of interest in medical school admissions areas getting even more stronger and thoughtful about this as they consider their applicant pool. So let's take each one of those three areas, the academic metrics piece, the activities, and the personal character piece, and spend just a little bit of time on that. Um, and I, I usually start with the academic metrics piece, mainly because I just want to get it out of the way. 
it's probably the least interesting, I think, aspect of the um, medical school application. Um, and I would say that particularly from our medical school's perspective, because ultimately in the end, I think our admissions committee is just trying to figure out, is this applicant ready now? Okay, and we understand the trajectory to that can be up and down and up and down. Yeah, you may have had your challenges in the past, but where are you now? Okay, and, and do we think as a committee that you've got what it takes to get through medical school with minimal challenges? Okay, so we're gonna start with the classroom performance piece. You know, um, that's uh, typically an important part of any medical school application. And I just wanted to sort of share with you that on the admission side of things, we have a variety of ways in which we can look at your undergraduate GPA. And, um, and I want you to understand here too that I'm talking mostly about GPA and not where you got that GPA, okay? Um, I think that's an important thing for everyone to sort of be cognizant of. In the end, we're looking at the GPA. It could be an overall GPA. We have ways of looking at your undergraduate science GPA, separated out from all of the other uh, social science and humanities courses that you may have taken. Um, because you know, medical school is a very highly uh, science-driven curriculum. Not that we ignore the humanities and the social sciences by any means, but of those three areas, science is pretty key. Um, we look at GPA trends, okay? Uh, we understand starting college, wherever that is, your own individual life experiences at the time, um, it's an adjustment. And sometimes when first people start um, taking college classes, it's um, not, uh, it's not a time, it's a time which they struggle a little bit, you know, and you kind of got to get used to navigating life and college coursework and work and all that other stuff. So we do like to see that if you have a bit of a rough start that you do get used to it and that we do, and as such, we'll look at the GPA trend. Did they start modestly and then move up? That's usually a good sign. I think if it's the opposite that tends to worry admissions committees a little bit more. You, know, you were all gangbusters at the, at the beginning and you were a good solid A, A, B student and then it started to kind of taper down. That might give admissions committees um, some pause to be concerned. And so if you find yourself in that situation or a situation where you're overall GPA or science GPA isn't as competitive as you think it should be to be a candidate for medical school, then that may mean that you might need to think about doing additional coursework after you graduate from college, whether or not there be um, additional undergraduate post back work to help demonstrate your readiness versus actual graduate science um, programs to show your, your readiness to, to help, you know, share a committee to a committee like ours. Hey, I struggled back then, but I'm now ready for this. And so um, based on my performance in my master's in my biomedical uh, sciences master's degree. So there's a variety of ways in which medical school committees, uh, admissions committees can take a look at your GPA. Then, of course, there's this dreaded MCAT um, that I think, you know, when it comes to this world of standardized tests, and for those of us that are, that take serious consideration of wanting to create opportunities for people that have had challenges in life, that want to get, want to make sure that the, there's an equitable opportunity uh, for everyone to get a medical education. Standardized testing is sort of that love-hate sort of thing. We all um, subscribe to it as a way in which we can compare our overall pool. Um, but at the same time, we also know that standardized tests favor certain groups um, over others. And so uh, we, we tend to, you know, have to be thoughtful about that in our admissions community, in our admissions world, because just because someone doesn't have the strongest standardized test score doesn't mean that they are incapable of being a wonderful medical student and getting through medical school. So, 
So um, just be uh, being um, thoughtful that yes, pretty much every med medical school in the country is going to ask that you sit and take an MCAT exam. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time about the logistics of the MCAT. Hopefully, you'll have plenty of time to sort of think about that um, uh, down the road. But as I move on from this, I do want to make sure that people um, uh, understand that there are various ways in which you can start to prepare for that standardized exam. One is right now in community college. There's a number of baseline science and humanities courses that should be available at most uh, uh, community colleges uh, in California. And these are wonderful courses that will help you perform as best you can on this uh, standardized MCAT exam. So the courses that uh, I think most would encourage uh, students to take, pre-med students to take are listed here, biochemistry, intro psychology, intro sociology, uh, research methods, probably plus or minus. I don't know if that's necessarily as important, but something to think about. A good baseline statistics course is probably helpful. Uh, less so calculus. Um, I don't think calculus is as emphasized as much as it maybe once was, maybe back when I was a pre-med student. But intro biology, uh, first year intro chemistry, organic chemistry, and an introductory year of physics is probably really helpful. Again, and we're not, no one's expecting anyone to sit in on an MCAT at the end of their uh, college, community college um, life experience. Um, but if you can get some of these courses done at the community college level, I would absolutely encourage you to do so, okay? So your, your baseline courses are gonna be the most important preparation for your MCAT. The other thing I'm going to point out here is this thing called the Khan Academy, um, which I'll refer, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about here a little bit here um, on this next slide, because it's an additional uh, way to help prepare for your MCAT at zero cost. Okay, and in my world, anytime I can um, help pre-med students understand that you don't have to invest a ton of financial resources to have wonderful preparation for uh, uh, preparation for taking the MCAT exam, I think we should absolutely promote that. And most of these resources are available uh, from the AAMC's website. Um, and I put a link here at the bottom of this slide that will get you to most of these free resources. But as I mentioned here, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Khan Academy. Um, and they have partnered with the, Ameri uh, the Association of American Medical Colleges, the AAMC, to provide an incredibly lengthy series, like 12, 13, 1400 short 10 to 15 minute videos that help you prepare for that MCAT exam. And I'm gonna move back here a little bit because so many of these free videos are probably really helpful study aids as you are sitting in these courses. So if you're taking intro biology, I'd be logging on to the Khan Academy and saying, well, what, you know, what did we cover in biology today? I'm gonna look those videos up so I can start to you know, ingrain that information here and use that as a reinforcement of what we've learned in, in our course such that when that time comes for you to actually take and, and formally prepare for your MCAT exam down the road, hopefully that goes a lot more quickly as opposed to having to sort of relearn stuff. So I'm a big believer in the Khan Academy video collection. I hope um, that most of you will take advantage of that resource. There's The AAMC also provides some uh, what I call almost free resources. Um, that are not overly expensive in the grand scheme of applying to medical school. I am a big believer in taking as many practice exams as possible. Um, uh, and, and to do that, you do have to pay a little bit for that. But I think the more practice exams you can take, the more you're going to go into an MCAT exam feeling confident about your abilities and your um, preparation to do well. 
I do mention some of these really expensive resources, not that I am here to endorse any of these by any means, um, but the reason I mention them is because down the road, you may um, get on a list, a pre-med list that these uh, private resources get access to your email. And if you get a solicitation from them to take an, a, um, to come in and take a free MCAT exam on their, you know, on their watch, I, again, I would encourage you to do it. Now you'll probably have to sit through a sales pitch from them, but understanding that most of us uh, as college students and often working college students, we don't have, you know, $1,600 to $4,000 to give private companies for MCAT prep. So as long as you sit through a sales pitch and say, gosh, thank you so much. Um, I, I just, um, I don't have the, uh, I'm, I'm not able to, uh, to uh, uh, participate further with your company, then by all means, take the free exam that they sometimes offer. Um, just real quick, I want to spend some time just so that people understand the MCAT exam is scored on a bell-shaped curve. The national average is a 501.5 um, on all four sections added together. This is the piece that I, I that I mentioned to you that I think is sort of the, the hate side or in the love-hate relationship that we have with MCAT because it clearly identifies that in various ways in which individuals do self-identify, there are groups that do not perform as well over as others. Um, we know that men, uh, people who identify as male tend to score higher than uh, people who identify as females. With regards to race and ethnicity, we know those who identify as white or Asian tend to score higher uh, compared to those uh, who self-identify as Black, uh, African-American, Hispanic, um, uh, and other indigenous um, uh, self-identifying groups like uh, American Indian or other Pacific Islander self-identifiers. Uh, we also understand that people who receive fee assistance tend not to perform as high. Um, people who are first generation don't perform as high. Um, uh, people who, um, and interestingly, if you have uh, a, uh, any kind of uh, self-disability um, that you have been diagnosed or with and that you get accommodation, uh, non-standard, people who have non-standard uh, test environments for the MCAT actually perform higher. Usually it's because the non-standard uh, accommodation is increased time to take the MCAT exam. So, so that's sort of an interesting identifier. And repeaters, um, if you take the MCAT once and then you repeat on the first attempt, again, you're, those individuals do tend to score lower, but if you take it as, um, uh, uh, on a second attempt, uh, your scores do tend to go higher. So anyway, this all sort of harkens back to what I was saying though about medical school admissions committees more and more in the, these areas are starting to try to think about what is the context of the life experience of an applicant um, that might help explain if they have a lower MCAT score, what is the context of that? And again, because that lower MCAT score doesn't necessarily mean that you can't be a wonderful medical student and get through a medical school curriculum. Um, but it, I, I think the more that admissions areas are starting to look at that and, and place less emphasis on MCAT scores, um, then we're starting to move in the right direction. Um, I just, th this is a slide, I know it's busy, but it's, uh, I just, I put it up here just so that people understand that um, for our applicants who have elite academic backgrounds, so highest MCAT scores, highest GPAs, that's this box up here. Interestingly, 13% of them don't get into medical school. So again, that's that holistic review piece that I'm talking about. It's not just about who is the smartest and the brightest, okay? People have to have the appropriate motivation. They have to have the appropriate life experiences behind their, in order to 
convince an admissions committee that they know what they're getting themselves into? And are, and are they doing it for the right reasons? Okay. And so, you know, as you go farther down this um, table, of course, you know, the likelihood of getting accepted to medical school does get a little bit less frequent. But again, you can see here that people with fairly modest um, academic backgrounds get into medical school, okay? Someone who has a 3 point to a 3.2, but a very fairly respectable 506 MCAT, 26% of you get into medical school, okay? So again, more and more medical schools are starting to look at some of these other two areas. So what I wanna say here is, uh, my take home on academics is as follows. Uh, you know, we still understand because of the large number of applicants that it the competition academically is still very strong and stiff. I'd also like to say though that, that from medical school to medical school, there is no absolute GPA cutoff and there's no absolute MCAT cutoff score that we can all agree upon. Okay. And in fact, many medical schools like ours, we don't even have GPA or MCAT cutoffs. We have ideas of what sort of past academic success people need to be able to demonstrate in order to get through medical school at low risk. But, you know, none of us can agree on, on, on what a cutoff should be if they, we even have them. So unofficially, as I usually tell pre-med audiences from my experience, and again, this is unofficial, I know it's probably going to be out there on social media and everything, but I will say this is just my expert opinion. It is not the, the anything that is um, written in our policies at the College of Human Medicine or anything like that. But I do tell most pre-meds, do aim to try to have a science GPA at or above a 3.5. Try to have an overall GPA at or above a 3.6. When you get an MCAT score, try to get it at about a 505, which is in the upper one third of all takers. Doesn't mean that applicants with medical, um, with MCAT scores and GPA below these thresholds don't get in to medical school. They absolutely do. And we're a prime example of that. Many, many of our students don't meet these standards. But it's because they're very, they have very strong areas in the rest of their application that makes us go, you know what, this person's going to, we're going to get them through this, and they're going to be really wonderful, wonderful healthcare providers to their communities of need. And spend just a little bit of time having you start to think about the various activities that you should be cognizant of as you are preparing for a future career in medicine. Most medical school uh, admissions committees definitely want to know about um, the various types of clinical activities, whether or not that's paid or volunteer. I don't think we care. Okay. But in general, medical school admissions committees want to know that you have looked at the variety of ways in which healthcare is delivered in, particularly in this country. Um, overseas experiences are valuable, but I think most Medical schools here in the US are trying to prepare their uh, medical school graduates for domestic careers for the most part. So we wanna make sure that you have a good idea of what is it that a doctor does, okay? And whether or not that's some sort of paid experience that you've had or a volunteer experience, I don't think we really care. We do like applicants who've had leadership activities and that know, have had lots of activities working with others in a teamwork environment. Um, we like to see applicants that um, push themselves a little bit outside their comfort zone. And by that meaning that you've engaged with others that have very potentially very different life experiences than your, than your own. Um, because on a day-to-day -day basis in the world of medicine, you have probably very little control of who comes in to see you in the office. And these are people who may have values and life experiences that are very different from yours. And you've got to figure out a way to make a connection with them. And the best way to start doing that is to start having experiences with people that are different from yourself. Um, uh, medical schools do like inquisitive, inquisitive uh, uh, students. Um, you know, that could be research, but it doesn't always have to be research. I think that there are some schools that do place a lot of emphasis on research, others don't. 
okay? Um, but they do want people um, who aren't afraid to ask a question. And so whatever that is in your life and to be able to share that in your application, you most definitely should. Um, we like to see people uh, and applicants who are involved in their communities that are um, possibly been able to demonstrate an ability to teach or to educate others. Because again, in the world of medicine, my, my job as a physician transitioned early on. I think it used to be people went to the doctor and the doctor told them what to do, okay? That's probably not the predominant method of healthcare engagement these days. My job as a physician is to help identify what the issue is and think about what are the various options that we could approach this healthcare problem with you. And let me tell, let me teach you about them and let me tell you about them so that you can be the one who decides what's the best way to approach this problem for you, okay? And in order to do that well, you gotta be a good teacher. We look at a variety of characteristics also, in addition to the activities, well, almost all medical schools want compassionate, respectful physicians, physicians that show empathy to those who are suffering, those who can communicate reasonably, who are culturally aware of the um, various uh, communities around them, who are mature, they have good self-awareness, meaning you know what you're good at and you know what you're not good at. Because if you know what you're not good at, that's gonna keep you out of trouble someday because you're gonna be raising your hand and screaming for help. And let me tell you, in the world of medicine, dogs have a hard time doing that because people think that they know everything. And the truth of the matter is we don't, you know, we don't know everything. And we have to have future physicians that are willing to raise their hand and say, I don't know who around me does, I need help, okay? So that's a really important piece of this idea of self-awareness. Do you know what you're good at? And you know what you're not good at? And can you back it up with life ex examples of that? We want docs that are honest, that have strong integrity, that are competent, that are both professionally and socially responsible to those around them. I did mention, I was gonna uh, mention just a few things about situational judgment tests. Um, there is a movement in the medical school admissions community to have applicants have the equivalent of a non-cognitive MCAT exam, okay? Meaning it's a standardized test that assesses how people behave in certain situations, okay? Um, and these are, tests, standardized tests that look for characteristics like collaboration, communication skills, empathy, a sense of equity, ethics, your motivation uh, to be a physician, your ability to problem solve, professionalism skills, maturity, so again, self-awareness, that sort of thing. There are two standardized um, situational judgment tests that are out um, right now. Uh, that many medical schools are starting to use. I will uh, uh, disclose the College of Human Medicine is using situational judgment tests on at the level of how they are screening their applicant pool. Um, and uh, given that we have two on the market now, we will accept either one, okay? Um, and, and so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time today talking about this, but just I, I think you just need to be aware that there are also these situational judgment tests out there um, that many, if not most medical students are going to, or pre-medical students are gonna be asked to take as they prepare for an application to medical school because more and more medical school admissions areas are signing on. Um, I'd like to talk just a little bit about what it is that we think on our side when we look at an application to medical school and some of the questions we ask ourselves. And, and because I think that's important for you to know, um, you know, on our side of the equation, we ask, is this applicant seriously interested in us? Okay. So as you apply to medical schools, you need to be thoughtful about that. Am I conveying a genuine interest in that particular medical school, particularly on a secondary application that they might ask me 
to fill out. So how can I fully express myself and let them know that I am specifically interested in them, okay? Some of the question, other questions we asked though, is do we have a realistic chance of matriculating this applicant based on our past experiences with comparable applicants? Does this applicant strongly resonate with our mission? If you don't, then we're probably not gonna take much further look at that applicant. Does the applicant bring life experiences that are difficult for us to find in our region? And I would say this is particularly relevant to those of us who um, uh, uh, oversee state-supported medical schools. You know, here in the state of Michigan, we kind of have an idea of what our what the demographic identifiers are in the state of Michigan. Um, and so what are the kinds of out-of-state applicants that are challenged, or what are the kinds of applicants that are challenging for us to find here in the state of Michigan that that might be able to bring diversity as an out-of-state applicant coming to medical school here. So, so we think about that a lot on our side, and I just think you guys should be aware of that as well. Um, a little bit of advice on where to apply. Um, and I think, you know, my biggest um, piece of advice is kind of let your, your career goals guide your search and apply to those medical schools that have similar values um, as what you value in what you see yourself doing someday as a physician. Um, I do think that you have to definitely look at your home state's medical schools first. Uh, we know statistically that that is your best chance of getting into medical school, at least perhaps outside of the state of California, which I always say here, California is tricky because there are way too many qualified, at least academically qualified applicants uh, in the state of California than what you've got spots for in your own respective medical schools. Um, and so uh, we full in the admissions world, we fully understand the running joke in California is that you have to leave the state to go to medical school in order to go back and, and serve your, your communities. And so that's, that's obviously the more, uh, a very common pathway for, for applicants from the state of California. I would say pay very, very close attention to the medical school mission statement and also their own respective admissions websites and social media websites, because that's where you're gonna find out about what makes that medical school tick. Why is it that they exist? What are their goals? What are their values? Because if your values and career goals do not align with that school's mission and or its uh, curricular programs that they offer, maybe painful to hear, but I'd say, don't waste your time and money applying. And that may even mean if that is a, a school in your home state, because if, you, if there's not a connection there that you can help both help the admissions side of things see, it's gonna be an uphill battle for you to get them to take a closer look at you. And then I always do say, please use the medical student admissions resource that is put out by the AAMC to help gauge any competitiveness that you uh, have uh, in thinking about which medical schools to apply to. I do always say, uh, do take a look at other state supported medical schools as an out of state applicant. Again, particularly if you have ties to that state and or that school's mission and program that they have those values. And then make sure you emphasize that in a secondary application and hopefully that subsequent interview. Use that as an opportunity to say, I've done my homework on you guys. I know what you're about, and I think we got a lot in common. Let me tell you why. Um, and that's what this gets at. Be specific in your application as to why it is that you are interested in that particular medical school, because I think the applicants that do that have a higher chance of getting an interview, which then gives you a higher chance of showing what it is that you have in common. This last piece of advice I always find is probably a little controversial. And I think for those of you, when, uh, when you're at a point when you're developing um, strong relationships with free health advisors at community college and at um, subsequent undergraduate four-year colleges, a lot of times they, I think there's a predominant theme of, you know, you may, because of your academic metrics, you may not be as competitive. And maybe that might be true. Having said, um, 
and and let me back up and as a result of that a lot of times the advice is from pre-health advisors is you got to cast a really huge net yes you got to apply to 50 to 60 medical schools and hope that one of them lets you in i think that's bad advice because i think if you've done your homework and you find a handful of medical schools that you've got a lot in common with that you share mutual values career goals that's where your bang for the buck is going to be. Apply to those 15 to 20 medical schools in a cycle that you know you've got something in common with and see how it goes. Because I think if you apply to 15 or 20 schools and you don't get in, the likelihood of you applying to 35 or 40 or 50 or 60 schools, it's probably not going to get you a better result. And it's just going to be in a more expensive outcome in which you didn't get into medical school. Um, and then what about, so now I am going to transition just a little bit to us in the College of Human Medicine. You've heard me talk a lot about the mission. Research the mission of respected medical schools, because here's what ours is. The Michigan State Col uh, University College of Human Medicine is committed to educating exemplary physicians and scholars, discovering and disseminating new knowledge and providing service at home and abroad. We enhance our communities by providing outstanding primary and specialty care. Again, we are a comprehensive medical school um, that is committed to educating uh, future physicians of all specialties. We promote the dignity and inclusion of all people and respond to the needs of the medically underserved. I think this is a really wonderful uh, medical school mission statement, and I feel really lucky and fortunate to work at a um, at an institution and at a college that values um, what we believe is the most important issue in healthcare this in, in today's society, and that is addressing the needs that, of margin, marginalized communities um, and the disparities that those communities experience in the world of healthcare. That's really key to us, and I think it's no um, mistake that the that the last part of our mission statement ends with promoting dignity and inclusion of all people and responding to the needs of the medically underserved, because I think that's what sets us apart and what sets the uh, that's what the reader of this mission statement will remember after looking at it. Our students who come here, they tend to have fairly decent uh, interpersonal skills. Um, they are diverse with a large uh, um, under a large umbrella of uh, self-identifiers, which are not, uh, this is not an all-inclusive list by any means, but um, we have uh, uh, students of all gender identities, age ranges, academic majors, life experiences, sexual orientations, their background, heritage, culture, their race and ethnicity. They do, for the most part, because we are a, a medical school with a strong social mission, they do come in with fairly substantial human service experiences, experiences in the clinical areas and um, experiences um, uh, dealing with social injustices and uh, a variety of civic responsibilities. Our most recent incoming class had an average age of 24, or uh, average age of 24 with a range of 21 to 48. Uh, there were 78 men, uh, one non, uh, gender non-conforming and 112 women. There you go, rock on gals. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we are a state supported medical school. So one of the things that um, is a tenant to us is that we are primarily here to serve the, the people of the state of Michigan and to serve um, the taxpayers of the state of Michigan. So it should come as no surprise that the vast majority of our students matriculating do come from Michigan. Our admissions process gives preference to those who are from the state of Michigan. Um, um, and, and so, you know, I have to uh, disclose that. Now, having said that, in an incoming class of 190, um, you know, 15 percent of 190 uh, is quite a few out-of-state medical students on a year-to-year -year basis. And so, you know, we're generally looking at about 40, 35 to 40 of that class uh, coming from out-of-state. Our admissions diversity statement, which I didn't share with you today, I probably should have, um, does specifically state that our admissions process also gives preference to people who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. So this last year, 
of our incoming class of 190 self-identified uh, or shared information on their application that led to them being considered a disadvantaged applicant. Rural medicine is important to us, rural health care disparity. So perhaps not surprisingly, over 20% of our incoming class self-identified as, as growing up in a, and uh, living in a rural environment, with the hopes that they will, many of them will return to those environments. 50% of the incoming class self-identified with a race or ethnic background that was something other than white only. Um, 23% uh, self-identified with a race or ethnic background that was actually underrepresented in medicine. So predominantly African-American, Hispanic, uh, indigenous, Native American, South Pacific uh, race and ethnic identities. Everybody had a bachelor's degree. Few had some master's degrees. And this is what the most recent uh, fresh hot, hot off the press where our most recent graduating class, what they ended up doing uh, or where they're going. Uh, and almost 98% had a placement by the end of the of match week. And the top six areas um, were family medicine, emergency medicine, internal medicine, peds, pediatric, or pe uh, psychiatry, and general surgery. Um, just under half entered a primary care residency, and a similar percentage are actually staying in the state of Michigan for their training. And of course, they matched into a wide variety of wonderful residency. Uh, training programs across the country. And with that, I think I am done. So I am happy to try to address any questions that, that you all have. And if that's okay with you, do you want me to go ahead and stop screen share? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm gonna so uh, ask your questions away. Um... Dr. Maher has been doing this for a while and he could be more insightful than reading uh, a blog or asking your neighbor. Yeah. Actually, I have a question first I, and I'm embarrassed to ask this. I'm an old guy and can I have five minutes to quick run to the bathroom and then come back? Absolutely. I am so sorry, you guys, but you know, like you said, you get old, Physiology isn't quite what it used to be. So I, I, I'll be right back. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm, okay. Let me. Um, there we go. All right. To ask away your questions, you could ask anonymous questions. You could ask any questions that you have. I appreciate your patience. So since you've been gone, we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A. Okay. And the first question is, how does Michigan State University view multiple MCAT retakes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the answer is it depends. Um, I think it's not uncommon. We'll see people who, that will take it up to three-ish times. Um, I think that when we start to see applicants who take it four and five and six and seven times, um, I think the committee struggles with that. And I think that they, I, I think, if that, if you find yourself in a situation in which you need, or you believe you need to take an, that standardized exam more than about three times, um, my advice to you would be make sure that you address that somewhere in that written application, okay? Because as much work as I try to do with the committee to get them to try to think about the context of an applicant and think, 
you know, ask them, well, if someone took it seven times, clearly there's a reason for it. Is there anything in the application that might help you understand why it is that someone had took it seven times? Is it, you know, because if they were working 50 hours a week while trying to go to school and, or they've now got their degree and they have a 60 hour work week job and they've been trying to get a really strong MCAT score for the last four years, and maybe they just now were able to do that. Does that does that help provide context? You know, and and I think sometimes getting admissions committee members to be universally thoughtful about that can be a challenge. I think the mess. I, I would say what you need to hear is that if you find yourself in a situation where you have taken it more than three-ish times, you need to probably be proactive and tell an admissions committee what was the context behind that. Because you don't want a committee to try to fill in the blanks, okay? They really want to know you. And, um, and they're not, at least at Michigan State, they're not afraid to love an applicant um, uh, who's overcome obstacles. In fact, I think they really love applicants that have overcome obstacles and now they're ready. Um, but I, but if you don't address that sort of, any, anything that you might think is glaring as far as academic readiness in your application, I think that would be a mistake. I think you need to share that. And I think most medical schools would probably want to hear that. Um, you don't want you don't want admissions committee members trying to predict or or self or, or, or fill in those blanks. The other thing is, uh, can you tell about not taking the MCAT as a practice, the actual MCAT? Yeah. Because we've we've read a lot of those. Um, in some blogs that people are saying, well, just take the first one as a practice to gauge uh, the real. Please don't do that. My what, one of the messages that I that I left out of this particular talk that I almost always include is your goal is to take that exam once. <laughs> it's expensive. It's hard. You and and if you take it as a practice. Just, just, you know, for giggles, just to sort of as a baseline, med schools are going to see that score, you know? So the, you are much, much better off spending 30 bucks to the double AMC for a real, you know, test environment style MCAT exam, and they've got multiples of them. I would much rather see you do that for practice, such that, you know, take five, four or five practice exams from the double AMC so that you know kind of what you think your score probably will be when you do actually sit down and take it and hopefully only take it once. Yeah, please don't, please don't take the real exam as a, oh, just as a practice. That's, the other thing is these these programs that you're paying, you know, two thousand dollars for. The first thing they make you do is take a practice exam before you start. So, just you know, so those people that are charging you that, that's the first step they take. So you should probably do it if you're doing it on your own. Yeah, and and I would like to reemphasize: I do not endorse anybody spending thousands of dollars with a private. MCAT prep company. I don't think it's necessary. I really don't. Yeah, we don't either. And uh, Madeline could be a test of that because she scored in the 99 percentile without taking a course. So congratulations. <laughs> We're going to have a talk about how to self-study for the MCAT in the next couple of weeks. If people are wondering about that. So yeah, she, I... she, she is smarter than the average bear. That's, that's I would tell you that. That's wonderful, congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, our next question is, how does Michigan State University view staying at a community college for longer than two years? 
Well, I think our experience is that most of our applicants who have community college experience actually do spend more than two years. I don't think it's a big surprise. Um, you know, I again, I, I think like even here in the state of Michigan, um, after you get a high school degree, you've got options and everybody's life is different, you know? Uh, people choose to go to a four-year university start for a variety of reasons. People choose to go and start at a community college for a variety of reasons. I think many of us in admissions and our admissions committees understand that for a lot of people whose route starts with community colleges, it's not that they may not have the luxury of being a full-time student at a community college to start. So um, I don't think, at least in my experience is that it doesn't raise a concern at our, in our admissions process. What I do, I think the thing that saddens me sometimes is that, I, that I'll see applications from students who get their associate's degree over a span of you know, two to three years, they go on to transfer to a four-year institution. And sometimes that four-year institution won't accept all of the credits. And so then they end up spending another three years at a four-year institution in order to meet their graduation requirements. I think that's the thing that saddens me the most. And that's actually a pattern that I will see that someone had, you know, they spent three years getting their associate's degree. And then when they transferred, then it was another three years or more in order to get their four-year college degree. And again, and, and there may be other reasons for that. And I think a lot of them is life hasn't changed. You had to work a part-time to 30, 20 to 30 hours a week as a as a student at community college, well, guess what? You transferred into, you know, Cal State Fullerton or, you know, University of San Diego or UCLA, and you still had to work 30 hours or more a week. So I would say, you know, if you find that your trajectory from high school diploma to college degree to become eligible to apply to medical school, most medical schools, and it takes more than five years for that to happen, don't, don't be afraid to tell us the story. You know, Again, you don't want people filling in the blanks or taking the this, this, this self liberty to try to fill in the blanks. Please tell us your story. It took you seven years to get your degree. Tell us why. Well, yeah, it's because I had a 30 hour week job and I was raising a, you know, I have a young family and putting food on the table. And, and sometimes I had two jobs and I did everything I could in order to keep moving forward. So, so tell us your story. Our next question is, what do you think makes Michigan State University College of Human Medicine unique compared to other schools? Well, um, I think, I do think that we are unique and that we are not afraid to explicitly say in our mission statement what we're all about. Um, that's one way. Um, I think as you explore like other medical schools across the country and you subscribe to the medical student admissions resource from the AAMC in your read mission statements, they all start to sound kind of the same, which I know is sort of painful um, when I give you the advice to say, pay very close attention to a mission statement. That's partially because I think there are a handful of us that are very deliberate about that. And we're serious about our social mission. Um, uh, I think that um, we have, as an institution, we have been recognized nationally in the past as um, a medical school that, whose graduates go on to serve um, underserved communities and that social mission of trying to reduce healthcare disparities. Um, that is a big piece of how we identify. Now, if you have a research interest, doesn't mean that we're not interested in you. 
either. Um, but that's not our niche, okay? And in, in the state of Michigan, um, we have six other medical schools here. So we have to figure out, what, at least in the state of Michigan, what makes us unique. And I think that that mission of serving the people and um, providing care to the medically underserved is huge. Uh, way in which that makes us more unique than others, at, at least regionally. Um, and along those lines, we have specific clinical track programming that um, is consistent with that mission. We have um, in years three and four, some of our students do a, a clinical track that is more rural based. So they graduate with a certificate in leadership in rural medicine. We have some um, that are have uh, additional track curriculum in public health. So they graduate with leadership in public health. It's not a, an MPH, a master of public health, but it, it's more clinically, clinically relevant public health information. So that if they know that they're gonna, their ultimate goal is to be the director of a county health department down the road, we're giving them the tools to really understand public health in a way that helps them remain focused on the clinical side of things as opposed to the need to do a master's of public health, which is really a more of a research degree. And so, so we have public health tracks and then we have leadership in medicine for the underserved, which is um, a program, uh, a clinical track program for students that know that they have specific um, career goals for more broad underserved medicine, maybe a little bit of an international underserved healthcare skew. So, you know, maybe your ideal practice someday would be, yeah, I'm going to work in Modesto, California for 11 months of the year, but that one month I'm going to um, volunteer my time with Doctors Without Borders, you know, um, or I have made a, a, an affiliate agreement with a university in Uganda and I have ongoing research uh, that is happening there and i'm going to go once a year to check in on that and see people and see patients and continue my research question there so so we have that kind of specific programming that i think is very specific and makes us unique um, amongst other medical schools as well and also he's been there for a long time so he must really like it yeah i mean you know 17 years um yeah, you know, uh, I, and and I got to tell you, the admissions piece is what gets me up and gets going every day because I feel blessed and lucky to oversee a process um, in which students with compelling um, social missions in medicine um, are going to be our future leaders, and and I and I'm very I, I don't take that for granted. I'm a very lucky person in so many ways, but. I'm especially lucky to be able to oversee a process in which the people around me trust trust us to to do the right thing. Uh, so we have a question from an anonymous attendee who says they are an older student who's been fully independent for many years. In regards to financial aid, scholarships, and resources, at what point does MSU accept an individual's financial information rather than a parent or guardian's? Oh, that's a uh, that's a good question. I mean, I will tell you this much: any medical student who matriculates here is actually considered an independent student um, and not financially tied to their parents. Um, and so, I would say at the time of application, I mean, you're everyone is considered that way now, um, uh, because even so, let's just say, for example. We, Maybe we have a student uh, who is, or an applicant who is still financially dependent on parents. Um, it is quite possible to come here and those parents might say, you know what, we helped you get your college degree, but you're on your own now. Okay, so that student, that matriculating student will have the same financial package as someone who is exactly like you that you've you know, you're, you're a non-traditional student, you've been out on your own, you really are not financially dependent on parents and that sort of thing. And so, 
So all of anyone who starts medical school here is actually considered an independent uh, student separate from parental assistance. And then one of our next questions is, how does being a member of the LGBTQ plus community affect um, applications? And should you disclose that in your application or interview? Man, someone must have heard that I just oversaw a session on this at, the, at a meeting in Denver last week. So, so um, a group of us student affairs, um, uh, those of us who are in student affairs, admissions is considered student affairs. Uh, from medical schools across the country actually met in person in Denver last week. And I submitted a proposal back in November about applying out um, both in, to medical school and to, um, to residency programs. And right now the research, the, the medical education research literature out there on this topic is pretty thin. Um, and so all we have right now are best practice advising. And there is some good, there is some good stuff out there in the literature that sort of is expert opinion. And that's all I can really offer right now um, is expert opinion. I, I have often told my dean, the dean of my medical school, if I could turn MSU College of Human Medicine into the gayest medical school in the country, I would do it in a heartbeat. Um, but I also know I can't compete with San Francisco and LA and Boston and Houston. And so, but having said, um, here's my take on it. Um, first of all, I think it's a very personal decision uh, to share that information. I would like to see common applications give applicants the optional um, uh, liberty to disclose that. Uh, right now, uh, the, the MD common application, the AMCAS application does allow applicants to self-disclose gender identity and what pronouns they prefer, but they haven't made that next step in allowing applicants to optionally disclose if they would like to, how they identify um, as a sexual orientation minority or not. And I think that it's something that um, most of us who value diversity in an incoming class, we understand that diversity is not just about race and ethnicity. It is about all the ver different variety of ways in which we identify, that we self-label. And I think sexual orientation is a part of that. I think religious affiliation or identities is a part of that. I think there's lots of sort of these hidden self-identities that we all gravitate towards, that we should have an option of sharing I think my if 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 you are going as things exist right now, if you are going to share, make sure you tie it into the as some reason as to why you are choosing medicine. You know, I, I think some of my most um, compelling applications from um, applicants who identify within the LGBTQAI uh, plus community are from those who can share that information and from that and from the life experiences as someone who identifies in that marginal, marginalized community, how is it that that has formed and played a role in why I'm choosing medicine? So, so I do think that if you disclose and choose to share, don't just do it as, a, as things exist right now as a way to just get that out there. I would do it um, with some purpose behind it. I think it would be in today's environment. Um, I mean, I know we live in a very polarized world these days with people who have very strong feelings about a lot of things. And in fact, you know, right now in Michigan, we have a, uh, most of us are, 
who care about this have a very heavy heart right now based on what recently happened last week with yet again uh, a law enforcement shooting of an unarmed black man. Um, we are devastated by that. But um, I think that if you can share that information and do it with purpose, I don't think that there are many medical schools out there that are gonna say, I don't want you in my class. I, I think that there is fear. And I think the, the, the literature that we have that's been published on whether or not to apply out or not, um, there still exists a lot of fear within the LGBTQIA plus community of which I identify. Um, there is a lot of fear in applying out. I think I don't want to say the fear is unfounded, but I also don't think that we need to be as worried and concerned about it as maybe as what we think we need to, particularly if it is part of the motivation of choosing a career in medicine. For our next question, we have somebody who's worked as a CNA's helper and is going to Mexico for public health shadowing, but they're wondering if that's good enough clinical experience. And they wanna know what type of clinical experience is the most valuable and what is looked for in applications? Oh, well, so every institution, every medical school might answer that question a little bit differently. Um, what I can tell you from my experiences with our committee is that our committee actually likes hands-on stuff. So the fact that you've done some CNA work probably is speaks loud, would speak loudly to this, this particular admissions committee. I think additionally to that, I think you got to make sure though, that whatever you've done, that um, you've put yourself in a situation to actually see what it is that doctors do on a regular basis. So I do, I think is the hands-on piece that you're doing right now, is that really awesome? Yes. I think that if you can do something though, that gives you a burst of experience, whether or not that's a shadowing experience or a volunteering in an emergency room type experience, I mean, some sort of environment that allows you to actually see what it is that a doctor does, that's probably the next key piece. So I think you're, I think you're right on it where you need to be. I think that that last piece of the puzzle for you is make sure I've got enough life experiences in an environment that really allows me to see what it is a doctor does. And I think those two in combination, you should be great. And then connected to that, um, how does doing clinical experience being paid look at? And we've heard that a lot of medical schools are looking for volunteer clinical experience, but how do they consider paid experience? My take on it is if you can get paid and get clinical experience, why wouldn't you? You know, I, I would say, uh, I'll be quite frank, I, I get frustrated when I hear that there are schools. And now whether or not that's true or not, I don't know. If it is true, that really strikes me as elitist. I'm really, um, that is really frustrating if there is a lot of truth. My experience talking to a lot of my admissions colleagues across the country is that they don't care. Um, I mean, do we want you to have some volunteerism on, the, on your application? The answer is yes, if you can, again, we understand, we see lots of applications that don't have volunteering, whether or not that's clinical or non-clinical. If you can do volunteering, some of us might say, I'd actually encourage you to do non-clinical volunteering because that actually tells us something about a person. This whole thing about clinical volunteering, well, it can be kind of self-serving. I think, you know, oh, I volunteered. Well, yeah, you did it because you knew you thought you had to in order to get into medical school. I guess my take on it is if you can get paid and get clinical experience, why wouldn't you? So like scribing, oh my gosh, what an awesome, awesome experience. If that's how you can help put yourself through your college education and put 
and pay your rent and put a ramen noodles on the table every night? Why wouldn't you do that? I think that um, I think that it, if there is a conscious expectation that every applicant has volunteer clinical experiences, then I think those are places that don't have a realistic pulse on what's going on out in the world right now. If you can do it, great. But I think particularly in the world of COVID and the pandemic these last two years, those kinds of experiences uh, don't get me started. Those are hard experience. The volunteer experiences in clinical medicine are hard enough to get um, at, at any time. The, the other the, thing, yeah, the other thing I would add also is that healthcare is very regulated. So mm -hmm. if anybody, if you want to come and touch a patient, um, you have to have some sort of certification and also liability, no hospital or clinical setting is going to take the liability of you touching a patient without right. some sort of certification. For example, doulas, you know, doulas, you know, go through a class and are certified. And, um, and so anything that you do, um, so, and then a the part of it they're paying you is that because they want you to be accountable and responsible. So for liability reasons. And so, um, I'm always really questioning when people say, oh, well, you know, I shadowed a doctor and they let me, you know, put my hand in their gut or, yeah. you know, deliver a baby. To me, that's really unethical in many ways. And also yeah. people putting their, you know, so, or going overseas and doing it to patients that are browner and poorer, then it's like, okay. But part of it is if you want to touch a patient, you have to be certified in something and be accountable for it. So you got to be qualified to do it. Absolutely. And, and I would, so I would give, I, I'd take it the next step is that if you are fortunate to have one of those sorts of volunteer or overseas experiences down the road and the person supervising you encourages you to lay hands on someone, I, here's the deal. If you do it, I'm not sure I want to know about it. I want to hear about the other aspects of that experience, but if you're not qualified to sew up a laceration, even though you had a physician standing over you saying, all right, you know, here's how you put the, the suit, the, the needle, put the needle here, poke it through. If you've not had, if you're not qualified or cer certified to have that experience, like I said, I'm not sure I want to hear about it. And then one of our last questions in the Q&A is, what question should a pre-med ask themselves when exploring an MD versus a PA career? And what is something that you must enjoy as a medical doctor? Oh boy, that's a tough one. Um, well, I think, I think one of the biggest questions you have to ask yourself is, do I wanna, um, to what extent, it's an, I think it's an autonomy question really when you get right down to it. As a PA, um, pretty much everything that you do clinically has to get signed off by a supervising physician. Um, and so I think part of it is, a, is an autonomy question. Um, some of it is a lifestyle question too, though. Okay. Um, I think we live more and more in a world in which a physician's assistant, a PA has a set salary, they have a set work hours. Um, and when you punch out, you walk away from it. If you have MD or DO behind your name, it sometimes is hard to walk away from it as you're stepping out of the office, because even if you're not on call, somebody somebody is on call for you. And if they're in a pinch, they may be calling you and saying, I'm sorry to bother you at two in the morning, but I need help. And so I think, I think in the end, it's a, it's a question of how much do you want to be responsible when you get right down to it? Um, 
I would not make that decision based on what you project as a fan, uh, as a occupational income uh, perceived difference. I think physician assistants get paid very well. They have very good lifestyles. Um, I think the worst thing that you can do is go into medicine and get an MD and a, or a DO degree and make hundreds of thousands of dollars doing it and get up every morning going, man, I hate my job. Um, that is, I'm just telling you that from my own life experiences. And part of that had to do with why I switched from family medicine to OBGYN. Um, I didn't, sw you know, I about halfway through that medical training, um, I wasn't happy. I knew that I couldn't be, I wasn't smart enough to be a good family doc. I mean, you really got to know a lot about a lot of things as a, a, and be a good family doc. I just, it, it never sat well with me, but the times that I was excited to get up and go to work in that residency training was when I was in the operating room and when I was delivering babies. And so I learned then and there that career satisfaction trumps any sort of career income potential. And which also speaks for why I, if I, if I, if I was really in it for the money, I would have stayed in private practice as a note. you know, I was a private practice <laughs> doc for, oh gosh, four and a half years before I returned to academic medicine. And you know, I know what my my income potential would have been had I stayed in private practice, had it had had I done so. So people who like me who go into academic medicine, we don't do it because all we care about is material things. We do it because it's a bigger calling. So the other thing is PAs are very different scope of practice in different states, but yeah. I think the importance of discovery and shadowing. Um, that's where the big process comes in because obviously Dr. Maurer loves medicine and he did two residencies. So he's, you know, uh, so I think asking somebody who loves what they're doing is really hard because, he, you know, I'm sure he works with PAs, but he doesn't know all the details. And I think being able to shadow a physician and a PA would give a good feedback on that. And that's why, med schools look for that discovery because the moment you press that send button for your AMCAS, it's 10 years. So you got to be happy doing what you're going to do for the next 10 years. So anyways, well, thank you very much for coming today. Um, I want, we're going to let you go as promised. We kept you three minutes longer. Um, thank you so great, much. It was great seeing you. Yeah, and you all as well. Thank you again. <laughs> oh, look at these two wonderful med students that we have here from Michigan State now. They're going to, I'm passing the baton to you guys. Unsupervised, you tell, <laughs> you're going to tell them the real deal here. So I'll, I'll let you guys go. Thank you so much. This was so wonderful for you to invite me today. I really had a great time and um, hopefully we can do this again. <laughs>